Good afternoon, everybody. I'll hand over to the Director General um, to give you today's case update, and then I'll talk briefly about testing and contact tracing, and then we'll go to questions. So, Director General. Thank you, Minister. Uh, kia ora koutou katoa. So, today there are five new cases of COVID-19 to report. Two are in managed isolation and quarantine, and three are community cases. The three community cases are all epidemiologically linked to the Mount Roskill Evangelical Church, and that uh, sort of grouping has been uh, genomically linked to the larger Auckland cluster. Uh, all of these cases were identified as close contacts and were already in self-isolation. Both the imported cases were detected at the managed isolation facility at the Ridges in Rotorua via routine testing around day three. The first of these is a woman in her 30s who arrived from Dubai on the 28th of August, uh, and the second is a child who arrived from Uzbekistan via Dubai also on the 28th of August. Both cases have now been transferred to the Auckland Quarantine Facility with other members of their bubble. Since the 11th of August, our contact tracing team has identified 3,192 close contacts of cases, and of these, as at 10 o'clock this morning, 2,992 had been contacted and are self-isolating. We're in the process of contacting the rest as quickly as possible. There are 104 people linked to the community cluster who have been transferred to the Auckland Quarantine Facility, which currently includes 75 people who have tested positive for COVID-19 and household contacts. Now, that number is actually coming down because some of the first cases that uh, were in the quarantine facility have now been considered as recovered and are now um, out, uh, back at home. There are seven people in, uh, with COVID-19 in hospital today. One is in Auckland City Hospital, two are in Middlemore, and two are in North Shore, with two further in Waikato. Five of them are on a ward, and two are in ICU, one each in Middlemore and Waikato. Eight previously reported cases are now considered to have recovered, to, and they are all community cases. With today's five new cases, our total number of active cases is 129, and of these, 35 are imported cases that were identified in managed isolation facilities, and 94 are community-based cases. Our total number of COVID-19 cases that we have confirmed is now 1,406, and as far as laboratory tests, yesterday 10,934 tests were processed around the country, and the total number of tests completed to date in New Zealand is 777,560. And finally, just a, a review of our public messages. I've, uh, we've undertaken a rapid uh, internal review to understand how an incorrect message regarding COVID-19 testing was disseminated over the weekend and to take steps to ensure that this doesn't happen again. Found the messaging developed was signed out clinically and it was appropriate in the conversion into a, a, a message for the public, an error was made and that a senior responsible officer should have signed it out as a final step. Uh, that uh, didn't happen. They were put in place a process to prevent that happening again. And I just want to acknowledge that that did cause confusion and I know anxiety uh, for Aucklanders and apologies for that. And since I haven't been here for the last week, I want to take the opportunity too to thank uh, Aucklanders very much for their work over the last three weeks to help support this response to this outbreak. Um, it has been of benefit both to Auckland and the rest of New Zealand, and in particular, the number of Aucklanders that came forward to be tested allowed us to get a very quick and clear understanding of the extent of the outbreak, and I want to acknowledge and thank them for their efforts. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Director General. Uh, last week, as part of our move to prepare to move uh, Auckland from Alert Level 3 to Alert Level 2, you'll recall uh, that we set a target of around 10,000 COVID-19 tests per day or around 70,000 over a seven-day period. Um, and we were aiming for at least two-thirds of those to be in Auckland. I'm pleased to say uh, that with a few fluctuations here and there, we have uh, more or less hit those targets. And I want to thank everybody who's, involved, who's been involved in that testing process. Our testing regime is an 
a critical part of our response to COVID-19, and it will continue to be so. So we will be continuing with a focus on testing at the airports, at the ports, in our isolation facilities, uh, but also in the wider community as well, particularly focused on three target groups, those with cold and flu symptoms, uh, people who are contacts or connected to places where people have had COVID-19 and the contacts of contacts. Uh, by Monday, we will be very close to completing full two rounds of testing for those at the front lines, the, those working in MIQ, those who are border facing, um, and uh, the regular testing regime will then be put in place from there onwards. So we'll be releasing further information about that by the, before the end of this week uh, as to who will need to be tested on an ongoing basis and how frequently they will be tested. Uh, as I've indicated before, that will be based on a risk assessment for their roles. Those at the highest risk will be tested most frequently, those at the lowest risk less frequently. Uh, we, I've been very encouraged by the way our contact tracing system has worked um, in this latest outbreak, um, and we've seen that the improvements that we've made during uh, during the gap between our two outbreaks um, have delivered us um, much better results this time around and faster results this time around, uh, but we can't rest on our laurels here. We always need to look at how we can do better. I'm very pleased to report that now more than 2 million New Zealanders have now signed up for the COVID Tracer app. So that's 50% of the population aged 15 and over. The high uptake and the usage of the app is even more significant when you compare that with other countries where they also have an app uh, where the use of that is voluntary. For example, in Ireland, uptake's been 37%, uh, and our neighbours across the ditch in Australia, the uptake has been about 24%. So uh, getting the, that uptake up to that level is something that uh, I'm very pleased about. And of course, we want to see that go further. We've also seen an increase in the number of scans, the number of people who are using the QR codes to scan uh, in and out. There were 2.1 million scans recorded nationwide yesterday compared to 1.5 million a week earlier. Some of that reflects the fact that uh, more Aucklanders will be out and about this week than last week. Uh, as I've said previously, new functionality is being added to that app um, and more will be added very shortly. Uh, the ability for people to add their NHI numbers will be added in, uh, in the next update, which is due out early next week. Um, we will also be able to customise contact alerts, so if somebody needs to be alerted to the fact that they may have come into contact with a COVID-19 case, then we can send them more specific details about that. So if people haven't downloaded the app, please do. If they haven't up updated their app uh, recently, then do that uh, beginning of next week when the latest update is now available. We're also working on further additions uh, and further functionality for that app, as I mentioned, and that will include uh, looking at whether Bluetooth technology should be built into the app um, and whether we should uh, have that capability for it to detect other, uh, other Bluetooth technology nearby and automatically record that. Uh, of course, the app does not replace the fact that uh, manual tracing uh, and our, our contact tracing system uh, will continue to be the backbone of, of our efforts here. And uh, what we're asking all New Zealanders to do now is the same as it's been all along, which is to keep track of your movements. If you're not using the app, then we ask you to keep track um, of your movements in some other way. Uh, Having good contact tracing and having people able to produce information to support that process as quickly as possible is one of the things we can all do to avoid uh, further escalation of alert levels in the future. So if you don't have a smartphone, I'm very pleased to tell you that we are now producing a little booklet uh, that you can use. Uh, these will be distributed from next week onwards. Uh, they allow you to keep a manual paper diary. We're aware that some of our senior citizens in particular uh, prefer to keep a paper record of where they have been. Uh, so these booklets will be available. They'll be distributed in packs of 10. Uh, we're asking organisations working in the community um, to order copies of these that they can distribute. Um, so particularly senior citizens groups, those where uh, in other parts of the community where technology may not be um, as appropriate or as readily uh, <clears throat> taken up. Uh, and they can be ordered from the covid19.govt.nz website. Uh, they can be ordered uh, and then distributed to uh, members in the community. Uh, we are also continuing with our trials of the uh, COVID card that was put on hold as we dealt with the most recent outbreak, but the uh, the trial in Rotorua and in a managed isolation and quarantine facility uh, is getting back on track, and we will see that in the next few weeks. Uh, I do want to say, in all of this, uh, 
the protection of people's personal data is important. So the COVID Tracer app gives people the control of their own data and we don't uh, intend to change that. So a final word for the people of Auckland uh, who are enjoying their freedom and will be looking ahead to their first uh, weekend at level two. Uh, our message here is if you, we still need you to keep following the guidance, keep wearing your masks, and if you are travelling outside of Auckland, either during the week or during the weekend, please act as if you were at home. So take your uh, Auckland Alert Level 2.5 with you wherever you go. So if you are having to travel out of Auckland or you've got travel plans over the weekend in particular, please behave as if you were still in Auckland. So still keep your, uh, you know, don't, don't, don't be attending gatherings of more than 10. Stick with those rules that are in place in Auckland at the moment uh, and we'll keep everybody safe. Now, I'm very happy to take questions. You can go first today. You said this morning that you haven't really sought any advice yet for Level 1, uh, and, and you said this morning that you haven't been asked for any. Does that mean, you know, with the, with the review coming up on Sunday, that Level 1 is not on the table for next week? No, it, uh, no, no, it's just literally we haven't got to that part yet. Um, as I think I also indicated, the advice for those Cabinet meetings comes together, tends to come together at the last minute because we're drawing on the most recent and up-to-date information at the time um, as we make those decisions. So um, we, we have got, you know, check-ins that the Prime Minister has signalled uh, all the way along and that inf when we do those, the information for those tends to be drawn together about 36 hours before the meeting actually takes place. We also need to go to a full level two and then the whole country moved to level one? Is that the thinking at the moment? Uh, we given the rationale around we, We've not made those decisions yet. So decisions about any change to future alert levels have not yet been made. Um, and, you know, obviously we're focused at the moment on, on getting everything functioning at level 2.5 for Auckland and uh, keeping it functioning at level two for the rest of the country. Um, and then, of course, we, we will be checking in regularly um, to look at what further adjustments might be made to those alert levels. Minister, yeah. Minister CDHB head um, David Meeks finishes, finishes on Friday um, and his staff are holding a guard of honour of him, for him today. Um, what message do you have for David, and, and are you sad that he's leaving? Oh, look, I thank him for his service to the people of Canterbury. He's a very well-respected leader of the uh, Canterbury DHB, um, and we wish him all the best for the future. I'm working very closely with the board. I'm aware that they're putting in place an interim management team um, following some turnover there. Working very closely with them, I think it's important that that new management team gets the opportunity to get up and running, um, and you know, I I'm working very closely with the board. I haven't got any further announcements to make on that today, other than the fact that you know we've been keeping in contact. The Director General was there last week, and we've had a conversation based Based on that, um, I have also been speaking to other people uh, involved in the Canterbury DHB uh, and getting their views. Um, I intend to go and visit there myself shortly when I get the opportunity to do that, um, so that I can uh, have some, you know, some dialogue with people on the ground there as well. On the DHB, why has um, Michelle Arrowsmith um, resigned? She was kind of the, the health ministry boss in charge of DHB before. With was she pushed at all, or was this kindly on her? Oh, own? Look, that's a staffing matter for the for the ministry. It's probably not an appropriate thing for us to go into here. Well, 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 Henry's um, earlier question: Why hasn't the resignation of seven execs from the CDHB prompted an inquiry? It uh, wouldn't necessarily prompt an inquiry, but it certainly prompted government action. We've been uh, very active there. We've been keeping in, in close contact. Um, obviously, when you're dealing with employment matters, um, there's a limit to the amount that you discuss those in public. Employment matters, it's executives. Yeah, look, in Canterbury DHB, there's it's clearly restrained relationships down there at the moment, and that's something that I'm very conscious of, uh, something that we're working to to try and support the resolution of. What's the ministry's role in that? Well, we've got an important role. That's why I went down last Thursday. I met with the board. I met with uh, each of the uh, seven executive members who are leaving and uh, spent some time listening to them. I also met with a large group of clinicians to hear their perspective so that I can um, you know, provide the minister with good advice and also that we can, can play a constructive role. As the minister said, that is primarily focused on supporting the board and the uh, new management team that is coming in to ensure the DHB is delivering services for the people of Canterbury and indeed the wider um, South Island. Okay, we'll come says, over here. David Mates has said that if Hagley Hospital building was built on time, the DHB would be breaking even because it's cost them $60 million in the last year and outsourcing surgery and patient care. What are your thoughts on that? No, the advice that we've had from both Ministry of Health and the Treasury does not support that assertion. 
He but also said that the population-based funding for the regions declined despite Canterbury's population growing more than the national average. Do you know why there's been that decline? Um, look, I, I, I know that there are a number of claims about Canterbury have been made um, <clears throat> in recent days. I haven't had a chance to go through every one of them line by line. Um, but I have looked at the advice from the Ministry of Health and the advice from the Treasury about Canterbury's overall position, um, bearing in mind that Canterbury now accounts for about a third of all DHB deficits around the country, um, and it, it, that is unsustainable. You know, there are some serious financial issues that there that do need to be addressed. Um, I'm aware that, you know, the, the reason for some of those is hotly contested by um, some involved in the Canterbury DHB. Um, I've been engaging in all of that um, and, you know, we'll continue to do so. But yes, there are some changes that, that need to come for Canterbury. Uh, clearly, they, they can't keep running up the sorts of deficits that they are, potentially, you know, to the detriment of, of other DHBs around the country. Up the, the back here. Uh, uh, we'll go up the back here. I'll come back to you in a minute. Just of the cases that arrived um, from India via Fiji, given that they had documentation showing they were COVID free when they bought it, how do you explain the, them having positive tests on the day three? Look, the thing that we've always said is that actually the day three and the day 12 testing regime um, is the most robust that we can have for New Zealand. We've looked at um, best practice internationally. The, the problem with a pre-departure test, um, as I've gone through before, is it doesn't account for the fact that you could be um, exposed during your travel. Um, and during any transits during your travel, um, and it also doesn't um, allow for the fact that you know you, you could get a you could just be early in your incubation period when you're leaving, um, and hence you'd, you'd get the false reassurance of a negative test before you leave, but you could still end up showing up positive in our day three tests here. So our system is designed to assume that everybody. Uh, who comes across the border could have COVID-19, and we treat them that way. And then we have a testing regime that, that continues to treat them that way until such time as we're absolutely confident that they don't. Do you have people, though, that were denied um, boarding to that flight because they didn't have negative tests? So that's 10 people that are no longer here and not in our quarantine facilities. So is there merit, though, in, in having that pre boarding test as well? Um, that's not a New Zealand requirement, um, as I, I mean, that, that may well be a requirement of the airline. Um, that, that's not a requirement in New Zealand. We've got, we, we're quite confident of our testing regime when people get to New Zealand, um, and we've looked at whether or not we should have a pre-departure testing um, system in place, and it's not something at the moment uh, that the advice and that the evidence would suggest that we should uh, make mandatory. Just on we'll that review yeah. of... I'll come back to you in a minute. Yep. Megan, Megan Woods indicated yesterday that health advice she'd received suggested MIQ was highly unlikely to be the source of the Auckland outbreak. Can either of you confirm whether that's also your understanding? Um, look, we, we simply don't know um, where the source of the current outbreak was, and no links have been established that link it back to MIQ. Um, and so it, it is a puzzle, and we may never know exactly how it made it into the community. But uh, we have not seen any genomic link um, or any epide epidemiological link um, back to MIQ or back to the border. Yeah. So, 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 Okay, okay. And, and she, I think Sorry. she said that the genomic testing yesterday indicated that it was highly unlikely to come from an MIQ. Yeah. Can you elaborate on that? Can I comment on this? So, of the, of the um, samples from previous MIQ uh, positive cases that ESA has been able to um, sequence, none of those have proven to be a sim similar to the subtype of the virus that we've found in this um, cluster. Uh, and but that is only about half of the samples that they have either been able to do a full or a partial uh, sequencing of. In the ones that are partially sequenced, and I think that's about 15, they've been able to do enough of the sequence to show that it isn't the same as the subtype that we've got in the Auckland cluster. But it doesn't yet, or and, and may never rule out that it could link back to one of the earliest or samples that hasn't been able to be sequenced as yet. It doesn't Does really mean it's highly it? unlikely, though. It just means there's no evidence to say that it is. Well, it's, uh, the more samples that we do, the less likely it is. You but, say it's highly unlikely. Uh, well, I, uh, I'm, the minister said highly unlikely. That I would leave that with her. She's in charge of MIQ. At the moment, we haven't been able to epidemiologically or genomically link it back to uh, someone who came through an MIQ facility and had the same type of virus as the one in this cluster in the community. You also say it's highly unlikely that it came from an airport worker or one of our port workers? 
Look, as I've said um, many, many times standing here, um, there really isn't any evidence to establish where, the, where the, you know, a clear link anywhere. Um, so it is a bit of a mystery. Is there been complications with the air border order because the rules were supposed to have been updated more than a week ago now? No, we, um, you, you'll, in, you'll remember we set aside, we, I put in place a mandatory testing order um, to do a full sweep of everybody. Uh, that was completed, and then we put in place a second order requiring a second sweep of everybody um, with the intention to then have a regularised testing system in place. So basically, I'll, we will be announcing the details or releasing the details of that by the end of this week um, as to what happens from next week onwards in terms of the regularised testing regime. In terms of the rules around air crew, you said that those were going to be yeah, updated be, or clarified. Yeah, they'll, they'll be released this week as well. The key issue there is we've been um, talking through and working with the airlines around uh, the uh, the overall implications for um, for any changes that we will we for, for the changes that we're in, intending to make there, um, and just making sure that uh, all of the logistics are supported, you know, are, are in place to support that. What we don't want to do is stop flights in and out of New Zealand inadvertently. We actually need flights to be coming in and out of New Zealand for you know for freight. We get our medical supplies through through air freight. Um, so we've just been working very carefully um, to make sure that the um, arrangements that we've got in place around air crew, and bearing in mind there's different types of air crew. So there's the flight crew, the people who fly the planes, and then the cabin crew for those who are carrying passengers, making sure that the risk regime there is as tight as possible. Um, our first um, priority there is protection first, which is to make sure that people don't get COVID-19 in the first place. And then testing is obviously the second, you know, isolation and testing is obviously the second line of defence there. We want to make sure both of those regimes are as robust as we possibly can make them. Are there going to be significant changes to the rules for you? There will be some changes, yes. And I'll be, I'll be, no, I can't do that right at the moment, but I will be announcing those or we will be releasing those uh, later in the week. Um, so and, they will, and some of them will come into force straight away and some of them there'll be an implementation timetable for. Dr. Winfield, the, the, the origin of the, of the um, cluster, is the Ministry of Health still devoting kind of significant resources to trying to find this out, or have you basically accepted that you're never going to find it out? And, and is it OK if we never find it out? Uh, we are very keen to find out uh, the source, and we will continue to work with the Auckland Regional Public Health Service and ESR, because both the epidemiology and the genomic sequencing will be critical in helping us find that out. Um, it, it may be that we don't find find out where it came from, but we are very keen to do so because then we can identify if there was a gap and we can close that gap, what that gap may have been or address what the issue may have been. But we are still absolutely intent on trying to find the source just as we are intent on um, containing the outbreak. Okay, we'll come, come over okay. During the first wave between March and June, returnees came across the border at the rate of about 5,000 every 20 days. This included 30 positive tests during the period including July when the first infections occurred leading to the Auckland outbreak, this had doubled to about 10,000 every 20 days and as of yesterday the number of positive cases coming across the border has increased 233% to 100. Do you think the government needs to consider doing what Queensland has done, their rate of overall cases is 30% lower than New Zealand, and cap the number of returnees per day or week? Uh, not as a measure, measure to exclude New Zealanders wishing to return home, but to keep New Zealanders here safe. The, the measure for us is um, is the capacity of our quarantine and our isolation facilities, um, and so we, we are running at slightly below capacity. We we ne we leave a bit of a buffer um, in place there for if we need it, and you will have seen that we use that to uh, move positive cases out of the community into quarantine. Um, and also, it means that if for any reason we have you know s sudden unexpected demand um, that we need to cater for, that there is some capacity in our managed isolation facilities in order to allow for that. Um, so we're confident uh, in our arrangements around the, you know, give or take, it's around about 7,000 at any given point in time uh, in our managed isolation and quarantine facilities. Um, we've, of course, looked at whether, whether there are other things we can do to increase that capacity um, and or whether that capacity should be decreased. We're confident, uh, sitting at around 7,000 at the moment, that the safeguards and the quality controls can all be maintained with that group. Mr. has had a bit of a crack at the government's um, handling of COVID-19 this morning, specifically the border. Is it helpful to have a minister so senior in this government being actively criticising the government um, at a time like this? Uh, look, ultimately, I think the 
New Zealand's overall success speaks for itself here. Um, we are one of the few countries in the world that went for 100 days without having any community transmission. Um, and we've managed to get on top of this reasonably quickly and ease restrictions as quickly as we possibly can. Um, there is no such thing as a 100% foolproof COVID-19 response. Um, it's a virus at the end of the day, and we continue to learn and we continue to uh, do everything we can to remove and reduce residual risk. But there will always be some risk. In his criticism there. Um, I don't agree with him, no. Uh, Minister, with reports of um, students not returning to school and finding work uh, for their families uh, who are struggling under COVID-19, what is the government doing to ensure that uh, those students are getting uh, sustainable employment? We've got a number of um, mechanisms in place, of financial support mechanisms in place for families that are experiencing financial hardship, including the COVID income relief payments. Of course, there's the job seeker payments available. Um, and then there are additional hardship grants available through work and income, for example. And of course, we put money into the wage subsidy to keep people in work in the first place. Um, <clears throat> where young people are uh, moving on from school for whatever reason. Um, some of them, you know, not all kids stay to the end of year uh, 13 and, and finish the NCEA level three. That's always been the case. You know, kids do start to leave schooling in those those upper year levels. My advice to them is, and, and the thing that I'm encouraging them to do, um, is choose a job which gives you a career pathway, particularly one where you can earn and learn at the same time. So an apprenticeship, um, some other form of on-job training. That would be my advice. Uh, we're working very closely um, with the Tertiary Education Commission, with industry training organisations, to actually get good quality careers advice available to those young people, um, so that they know what's available to them in terms of you know potential jobs and so on. Yes, the, the, messaging, the review of the messaging over the weekend, Dr Burfield, did you get the message that you actually wanted to get out, out in the end? Uh, yes, well, uh, I understand that the... Uh, the message was changed, and the message is the same, and the Minister just uh, reiterated that. Anyone with uh, symptoms should, whether in Auckland or elsewhere, should be tested. There was some testing of asymptomatic people being done, not just in Auckland, but around the country as part of our surveillance over the last uh, week or two, and I think that message got out. Uh, and likewise, as the Minister said, there's a lot of testing happening of contacts, of con contacts in Auckland. Is it the case that you wanted populations at risk of worse health outcomes to be tested in Western South Auckland, and that message never got out to that? Well, I think uh, that message had certainly gone out to all the district health boards. I had sent it out uh, in a letter to them, and that was what was guiding the uh, offer of testing at general practice and also uh, at CBACs. Uh, I should also um, say that uh, we were wanting to test some asymptomatic people, uh, again, as part of our surveillance, and this is what we did as we came down from Alert Level 3 to Alert Level 2 uh, last time. So that didn't get through to those at-risk populations, so Māori, Pacifica seniors, those with immunocompromised, those who are immunocompromised, that's who you needed, wanted to be testing, right? Well, actually, that message was going out through a range of channels, and the letter I had written to the DHBs and primary care was earlier in the week, so quite, um, I'm confident that the message was getting out to those offering the testing, and that was guiding the offer of tests in general practice and also um, in CBAC. I'll come to you in a minute. We'll come up the back and then... When's Cabinet re-looking at the alert levels and when will that, uh, the public know uh, the outcome of that? Uh, look, Cabinet will be looking at them regularly for as long as the alert levels are in place. Um, and uh, we've got another Cabinet meeting, I think, on Friday. Um, and we'll continue to uh, you know, review as, as necessary and... The Prime Minister will make appropriate announcements based on those. Dr Bloomfield, just on the um, mystery cases, there was one on Saturday where you couldn't uh, find the lick. Have you been able to identify that? Uh, my understanding is yes. The, uh, so the only two cases now where we haven't been able to find uh, either a genomic or an epidemiological link are uh, the uh, case of the MIF uh, worker uh, uh, and also uh, the... Um, uh, one case was someone who'd been in a managed isolation facility some months ago and the, the uh, challenges in trying to get the full genome of that person sequenced. The initial indication was that it looked like it was linked to this current outbreak, uh, but ESR hasn't been able to fully sequence the genome. So okay. those are the only two. But in both those cases, there is no further spread on beyond those cases. We'll do the last few questions. So over, so yep. Just on the COVID-19 Trace app, so you've got 2 million people who have downloaded it, and yesterday you had roughly 2 million scans. So that's roughly one scan per person per day. How effective is that really? Um, I think, you know, that, that's a, 
obviously averages are, are a dangerous thing here. Um, we're, we're all quite active people in this building, and so many of us will be scanning a lot of times in a day. For a lot of people, they'll be going to work, they'll be scanning in at work, and they may not be doing other scans in a day. Um, so the key thing is we want people to be keeping good records of who they're coming into contact with. I think the COVID Tracer app, the more people that use it, uh, and the more people who use it regularly, um, the more of a tool that it will be. Well, we'll come back, we'll, I'll, I'll come back to you in a minute. Just on those testing goals of around 10,000 a day and looking to have 70,000 over seven days, you said that those targets were more or less. Yep. Could you just... I think it was about 67,000 and something over uh, that particular period of time. But then, of course, there's the next day. It depends on where, where you actually end up um, uh, counting from and to. Um, so I think it was about 67,000 we got overall. And how many days were the 10,000 tests reached? It was an overall target. We do expect the numbers to go down in the weekend. So some days we were over. We were sitting up around, you know, in that 10 to 11, 12,000 bracket, and then others we, we dropped down. I think the lowest point we got to was about 8,000, I think, in a day, which is over the weekend, which we do tend to get lower test results over the weekend. Yeah, um, Dr Bloomfield, the draft arrangement for a travel bubble with Cook Islands was being drawn up last month, obviously, pre-outbreak, and the Prime Minister hoped it would, could be in place by Christmas. Have any plans come across your desk yet, or do you know where that's got to? Uh, no plans have come across my desk. Health is just one of the agencies that's been uh, heavily involved in the planning for that bubble. That has been paused, of course, while we've been managing the outbreak over the last three weeks. Are you, okay, comfortable, let's come up the back here. Thank you. Are you comfortable with Aucklanders attending a conference in Queenstown this weekend? I just want to, uh, well, actually, yeah, Minister, you, you might want to comment. No, mm. is, the, is the simple answer to that. We're asking Aucklanders um, to continue to... Um, take their alert level restrictions with them. So the alert level restrictions in Auckland suggest you shouldn't be attending gatherings of more than 10 people. Um, and so if Aucklanders are travelling to other parts of the country, the same rule should apply to them. Now, obviously, we are asking for goodwill from Aucklanders. We are asking Aucklanders to play their part, as they have done over the last th three weeks, um, in keeping the rest of the country safe. Um, there is never going to be a 100% um, enforceable system when it comes to these types of restrictions. So we're asking people to do the right thing. Can it be doing an alert level review on Friday and making it public? Um, look, I, to be honest, I can't remember what the meeting on Friday is for, so um, I'm not in a position to uh, to make those announcements here. I just know that there's a cabinet meeting on my diary for Friday. Um, so <laughs> we'll, 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 go to, we'll go to Jason and then... Keep um, those um, booklets that you were talking about at the beginning, the manual ones, um, are they free or do we be able to... They will be free, okay. yes. Do you have any update on um, how many cases there are that have yet to be epidemiologically linked to the cluster? There's the, there's the North Shore ER person and then there's the Mount Roskill uh, group. How many people are there and are there any? Uh, there are no... Uh, actually, I don't have it off the top of my head, but we will include something in the update today. Uh, I think off the top of my head, it's, uh, there are six cases or six groups of cases. There was the original um, general practitioner and that grouping which came up quite early. Uh, and there's a case that um, is, was located in Botany, which we talked about, uh, which was one of the cases announced yesterday. And there is a small grouping around that, but we'll include an update in the uh, written statement today. OK, We're last two questions, one here and one here. Regarding the nurses' strike tomorrow, do you support pay parity for primary health care nurses? And will the government provide any extra funding? The um, look, I'm not going to get involved in the industrial negotiations as you would not expect me to. Um, ultimately, they are um, employed by private practices. They are, you know, the, the, the government is not their employer, um, and so there are a variety of factors that those employers take into account in their negotiations. But in general, the government supports pay parity, equal pay for equal work. That's a basic premise that we do support. Having said that, um, in primary care, we are not the employer of those nurses. And I'll give you the last question. You had your hand up before? No, yes. I didn't actually. Oh, you didn't? Okay, well, you, you, you can have the last um, question. You said to me this morning that there were two cases um, that came from the maintenance worker at Ridges. Do you know if they were colleagues or family members? Um, from member, they were Family members, I Let's think. Let's just check. We'll, we'll I, double check. I, I don't yeah. think there were... were I, may, I don't want to be seem to be saying something different okay. to you, Minister, but I don't think there were any... I think, actually, that despite testing of family and work uh, colleagues, including serological testing of work colleagues, to see if... Um, he could have got the infection from one of them. There was no, there were no other cases, but we'll confirm that. Yeah, so... Yeah. OK, thanks, everybody.